Thank you very much, Heather. Hello, everybody. My name is Cosmin Korenda. I'm working for United Nations University. And um, um, I'm a lawyer by profession, but today I will try not to keep it so legal, so not to be so boring for you. I'll try to speak more general, considering that this is the first session which um, intends to present um, legal aspects at CBA 7. Okay, here we go. So um, I wanted to know from the beginning that it's, um, it's a paradox. There is not so much to talk about, legally speaking, in the international arena. Nothing happens. The climate negotiations are not very going very well. International agreements are not there yet. However, there are over 1,000 agreements, conventions, understandings on environmental law in this world which are not used. It's the, most, it's the branch of law which is the most uh, agreements and conventions and international level and it's a pity that people are not aware of that so my presentation will be about that um, I started a few years ago when I started my research in Pacific and I've noticed that the base to conduct research in Pacific is not present it's customary law it's traditional law which is regulated by 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 uh, families and uh, clans but not so much of written law. So this is where I came up with the um, idea of having a solution in order to try to find uh, a better understanding of what law and what law can bring to climate change and community-based adaptation as well. Uh, this is where the name of the hybrid law comes. And um, it intends to bring three branches of international law, which is the environmental law, the human rights law, and the refugee law, and put them together to work to, to analyze a case. It started as a research tool, however, it was so much spread during the, around the world, including the Inuit case in Arctic uh, petition, and many, many students around the world are using it, that probably, hopefully, next, in the next future, it will become a, um, a concept of law. So um, you took the three branches of, inter of international law, and you are putting to work for you in order to create a better case analysis. This helps you uh, for, several for several reasons. However, the purpose of it is that you are taking an environmental law case study. So it's a climate change case study, anything. You can take floods, you take, can take sea level rise, you can take droughts, and so on and so on. So this breaches some principles of international, of international law or of environmental law. What, what happened? The first reaction of people and the first reaction of the society that the human rights are violated instantly. So if you have a, if you have a flood, the right to uh, housing is the, uh, it's affected. Sometimes right to health, right to food, right to development, and so on and so on. If you um, have silence, it's the right to life itself, it's, which is affected because you might, uh, your island, in the case of Pacific, might disappear, and so on. So this is the first fact which happens. And then it's a tendency that people have two choices where they do this, and they adapt or they flee. Unfortunately, the fleeing case, which is called the migration, and it's somehow related to the refugee law, it's, increasingly, uh, uh, it's increasing every year. So over 30% of the case where a people it's affected, regardless if it's rapid onset or slow onset, people tend to flee. Which is um, not, and then sometimes there you have the, the scholars and everybody starting to talk, oh, okay, it's a migration uh, as adaptation or it's a migration of a failure of adaptation and so on and so on. And all the discussions start to come around. So the advantages of using the human rights, the, the uh, hybrid law, has, it's, it clears the case study from the legal perspective and it gives you the opportunity to have it more, uh, to see it more clearly. Um, for example, some principles of environmental law, like the principle do not harm or uh, uh, polluter pays and so on and so on, uh, are more developed than the human rights law, for example. And the human rights does not, prevent, does not give so strong tools in order to address those violations in the case of uh, climate change. And then the second, which is a most important uh, advantage, is the increasing protection of the people. Because it's a human center potential, and uh, you have to talk, we have to talk about the people who are affected in the communities. So, um, the example, for example, uh, it's a principle of refugee law, which is called non reforma. The, the receiving society, the receiving country, is not supposed to send you back if you are in danger. 
This is a large interpretation of it. And it can be applicable in any, any climate case, in any climate change case, for example, tsunamis in 2004 or the floods here, or uh, um, even in, um, all the Southeast Asia and Pacific uh, most currently. So the, from the environmental law, this is the dreaming principles of um, the, the environmental law, which unfortunately, they are not happening. So you have the duty to not cause environmental harm, which is actually breach every day. You have the polluter place principle, which is actually talking, bringing back to the mitigation discussion earlier today, which is not very effective. And um, from the human rights perspective, you have you, all you can see that every climate change scenario affects at the points your human rights. There is no such a country with no human rights violations in the world. This is clearly. However, the climate change is even uh, emphasizing on the, viol on the violations, unfortunately. And some rights, which are not so, uh, which are basic human rights, are becoming affected. You have the right to work, right to development. In the case of the, stat of the states, you have the right to self-determination, and so on and so on. Um, from the refugee law perspective, of course, you have heard, of course, like a million times probably, the discussion about the refugee, uh, the climate refugees, and the climate migrants. Theoretically, it, it's illegal, I mean, it's not illegal to talk about it, but they are not existing. According to United Nations High Commissioner of Refugees, they do not exist. The, the uh, convention from 1951 and the, its protocol from 67 does not regulate the climate migrant or the climate refugee because they say that the persecution which happens in the state has to be from social, for social, cultural, or political uh, reasons. However, if you have this, uh, this, this uh, definition and you make it broadly interpreted, you can see that a person can be interpreted to be persecuted by a climate change event in, all, in its own country. That brings to the discussion a lot of, a lot of uh, theoretically in law and a lot of opportunities to create these legal frameworks everybody wants and everybody needs. Another example is the principle of non reformat which I mentioned earlier before, which is applicable only to the refugee law. However, if you take it again and you, uh, you give it a broader interpretation, it's, it's, uh, it's much easier to, to work with and apply in the climate change scenarios. IOM came in 2007 on environmental migrants definition, but it's soft law, which means it's not binding. Everybody's just uh, taking it as a recommendation and so on. And it's very broad. It brings everybody on board. However, the state do not recognize it. People do, are not aware of that and actually is not so much regulated. The community-based adaptation, this is a community-based adaptation case study. And this is, means that you, if you act locally and you take the bottom-up approach instead of the top-bottom approach, it can bring you more benefits. If you start bringing at practitioners legal questions in your research or legal questions for the communities or develop legal frameworks at the community level, that will increase the protection of the respective community. And that will be more, it will give more legal heaviness to your, to your case, to your community, and more of that, it can be brought to the national or uh, regional level. So the bottom-up approach is very important and not stay there and wait for an international convention to come and regulate us and so on and so on. And meanwhile, what we do? Well, we just fight, we have some awarding, uh, lack of language discussion and so on and so on. Of course, for that, you have to be open-minded. So uh, it's called progressive interpretation of law. And this means that you have to see law as a tool in order to help people and not necessarily to regulate them in a, in a way they are not aware of or they are not willing to. And this progressive interpretation of law, it means that it can bring a lot of benefits to the people at the local level more than international arena. We don't have to wait for the international arena to react when we can act legally and eventually take advantage of those 1,000 conventions, agreements, understanding, and so on I mentioned before, and um, uh, put them to use. Thank you.